the area. Uh, but that being said, uh, Director Bolton, maybe you could join us and, and maybe give us a, a, a brief little thumbnail of your position and stuff, and maybe we could go ahead. Yeah, um, so I am in the infectious disease department at Swedish. I actually started uh, at downtown uh, Swedish and at the Poly Clinic, and more recently I've uh, located at the Edmonds campus, which is, is really excellent. Uh, but the, the group is all together, and so if you ever want to uh, ask a question of me, I'm uh, available. Um, my contact information is there. And uh, I also um, did a PhD in uh, malaria and HIV. So I've been interested in, in research as well over time. Um, and so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, community acquired pneumonia, nosocomial pneumonia, and aspiration pneumonia. I gave this talk to you guys in hey, 2000. Michael, maybe uh, hold, uh, hold it one second. I think Sarah wanted to inject something here. Sure. Really quickly, I just wanted to mention Jefferson Healthcare is also with us this morning. So we have both Olympic Medical Center and Jefferson for our monthly CME. So welcome to all. Yeah. And remember, this is being recorded. <laughs> and it's going on YouTube, she said. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, and, and please, uh, you know, I, I, I enjoy having interruptions and, and talking about things. So anytime anybody has a question, either put it in the chat and she can uh, send it over to me or, you know, if, if I can hear you, um, please interrupt. So again, uh, when I gave this uh, in 2019, it was just before COVID, we were just talking about how you know, I, that's a, a huge box to open. I could give, a, you know, five hour talk on COVID. Um, I will mention a few things along the way. And um, and I actually worked on one of the um, research uh, uh, projects on getting uh, molnupiravir to market. Um, but that was that that's not financial. It was just I was in, in the um, in the uh, the study, so um, so quite interested in the science behind this stuff as well. Um, so that's sort of my background. Um, the uh, objectives is so that we can all, you know, identify uh, community acquired pneumonia, nosocomial pneumonia, and the guidelines for treatment. So practical stuff. Um, another thing that's really practical, and I run into a lot in the hospital is uh, the difference between aspiration pneumonitis and aspiration pneumonia. Uh, again, we do a lot of um, antimicrobial stewardship, and so that's a, a good place to decide when to use antibiotics. And then um, I had also last time brought up the use of procalcitonin uh, to really help us, you know, identify when antibiotics are helpful and when they're not. Um, and so I think that's pretty, is pretty useful. So. Um, I'll go into that. And as I said, I, I probably will, um, you know, give little side uh, lights on on how COVID has affected uh, what we're looking at uh, without diving directly into COVID management. So again, pneumonia overall uh, is serious. And so already with the COVID numbers, you know, the, the numbers I'm giving uh, from the CDC, they uh, they're not lumping COVID into this because that would obviously overwhelm, you know, the system. If you looked at the number of admissions and deaths, uh, this is not uh, this is this is pulling COVID out because uh, we, we really want to you know kind of focus on the um, other pneumonias that we treat. But you know uh, the 2020 um, numbers you know there's over a million emissions uh, even more than that in the ERs and it's a it's a very very common uh, uh, cause of hospitalization in patients and death although this has gone down last time I gave this talk it was the sixth leading cause of death um, in the U.S. Um, so there there have been some improvements now again COVID would change all of these things so um, and so this is uh, this is the impact of um, age on the incidence of of uh, hospitalization. So with increasing age, now this does not include um, children, uh, which are uh, have a large number of hospitalizations. But starting at eighteen, and as you go up by um, decade or so, the the 
number of um, hospitalizations increases dramatically. Um, and mortality also is very highly uh, affected by age. So, um, so I want to just kind of go over what pneumonia is. Um, again, it's a, a direct infection of the alveoli. Uh, it can be either viral or bacterial, which is important. Um, versus a pneumonitis, which is uh, inflammation of the alveoli. And that can be with or without infection. Um, bronchitis is something you'll also find that the, the, the one of the reasons I'm kind of differentiating some of these things is because of our, our diagnostics will um, not will uh, be different, especially procalcitonin. Um, these upper airway infections are not uh, interacting with the alveolar environment. And so the signals from uh, the alveolar uh, cells are different. Um, and that affects both uh, our diagnosis with procalcitonin. And again, I'll throw a COVID thing in here in that uh, a lot of the COVID, the worst COVID damage comes from the pneumonitis or the immune uh, react activation uh, at the level of the alveoli. Um, and so bronchitis is more inflammation of the larger airways um, and, or, and they're in the middle, you'll have a bronchiolitis. Um, when it comes to uh, the progression of infection, where I will later talk about aspiration pneumonia, um, as you get uh, out into the alveolar infection, you're more likely to uh, run into infections that get into the pleural cavity. Those are very different um, to treat and also for diagnosis. Again, you're in an environment where the infection is not interacting with the immune system in the alveoli. So things like procalcitonin will actually be normal, even though you have a raging infection uh, out in the uh, uh, pleural area. And uh, again, you it's it takes a lot different treatment. You're going to need to usually aspirate that fluid out and treat for a lot longer. Um, and then uh, finally, you can uh, develop uh, along this progression in, into an abscess, um, which, you know, generally these abscesses we don't drain, you know, because it would be dangerous to. Um, but, uh, and, and this actually, again, is usually a sequel of um, more the aspiration pneumonias, um, although you can get them, especially with MRSA and other uh, infections like that. Uh, generally, these uh, are the change. The difference here, again, you're not uh, interacting as much with the um, inside of the alveolus, and your uh, treatment is going to be a lot longer. So, difference in treatment and where where you where you find your infection changes treatment. Um, the other thing to think about is, you know, we're constantly being uh, exposed to microbes and there's going to be a lot of different uh, factors on whether or not you end up uh, getting a colonization and then an infection. And so all of these things, when you're thinking about a patient and whether or not they're likely to get a pneumonia or need prevention, like uh, uh, immunization or something like that to prevent pneumonia. Um, you think about these things. Uh, age, of course, can affect these things um, a, a, as well as uh, immunizations, especially for antibody protection. So um, so the, a lot of these things can lead to uh, breakdown of these systems can lead to pneumonia. One of the reasons that uh, it's worse in older age um, so looking again at uh, where the infections happen and the reaction to them uh, will, you know, affect both the disease itself and also uh, the x-ray uh, evidence of disease when you're trying to detect it. So uh, when the infection is mostly in the alveolar area, for instance, with your typical pneumonias, such as um, 
strep pneumo is the most typical, or H flu would also be one. Uh, the, the infection is usually happening in the, the, the lumen of the alveolus, and so you get an infiltration of neutrophils uh, into that space. Uh, and also, um, you know, you'll also have these uh, cells that are reacting to the uh, infection and sending out signals. So again, this will later uh, be apropos when we're looking at diagnosing these and looking at procalcitonin. Um, there are factors in like, especially the cell wall of these uh, bacteria that uh, induce an innate response uh, and send the immune system down a certain direction to fight these things off. Again, they want you want to attract more neutrophils that are helpful to kill these sorts of infections. And so procalcitonin will be elevated. What happens uh, with the filling of the uh, alveoli with uh, all of these fluid and inflammatory cells um, on the x-ray, you'll see the classic low bar pneumonia. Uh, I remember in my training, I always said, well, it can, you know, it might blossom the next day. I always said it was because the person was dehydrated, uh, needed more fluid, and by the next day they had enough fluid, although that's really not true. It's, it's the evolution of, um, you know, this, these alveoli filling with these uh, neutrophils more than anything. Um, and so then other patterns uh, that you can get, um, you know, if there's more of a, so this would be a, a, a typical uh, uh, low bar pneumonia down here. And so a bronco pneumonia, you can have more of a patchy uh, appearance on your x-ray, as you might see over here. Um, and you know, this this happens a lot when you have the bronchioles uh, more involved in filling and um, the you're not having um, just one section of uh, the lung filled, completely filling the alveoli. Um, so the other thing that we call atypical pneumonia um, generally is more of an interstitial pneumonia. And the difference here is that uh, most of what's happening is going on in the alveolar wall rather than the lumen. And so, and you're going to get a different immune response here. Again, you're going to have different signals that are sent out uh, from the cells and which are going to uh, attract more monocytes um, rather than neutrophils. And you'll get a fibrinous exudate um, that uh, lines the cell, the the inside here, and the appearance is is quite different. You're more likely to get a diffuse, patchy uh, appearance on your X-ray, um, and a lot of it is perihilar concentration. Again, I'll throw a COVID thing in here. You know, one of the early on, I remember when we were trying to recognize uh, people coming in with COVID on X-ray is it's it's very much. Uh, peripheral even more than some of these other things like mycoplasma and chlamydia. Um, uh, there's a very uh, peripheral enhancement on the chest x-rays. Uh, again, because this is the sort of uh, immune response that uh, is being generated um, by, by a viral infection. Uh, again, you're going to want uh, the prime, the neutrophils don't clear viruses very well. You need uh, lymphocytes and mononuclear cells. So uh, that's the way it looks. So again, if you the typical thing that you would have on the patient presenting with a typical pneumonia, somebody might be healthy. There's usually a pretty uh, sudden onset of symptoms with fever and shortness of breath. They um, can get uh, sick pretty quickly. Uh, usually you're going to have, um, again, SIRS criteria met. Um, uh, pneumonia is one of the leading causes of sepsis uh, in the hospital. Um, you, the cough is generally more productive because, again, you have more fluid in the alveoli. Um, uh, low, and when you're on exam, you can often hear some dullness to percussion or breath sounds in the area of the infection. Uh, Agophony is a pretty good one. 
um, to here. And again, the chest X-ray shows a lobar pneumonia. Um, in your labs, you're often going to see uh, elevation of your white blood cells, especially again, we were talking that the new uh, the neutrophils are um, the lead in responding, and so you get a left shift. Uh, and you'll see that in um, in the sputum. Sometimes if you send the sputum, you can find the organism there. So an atypical um, acquired pneumonia would be, you know, again, there's a whole variety here, um, especially when we're talking about uh, things other than COVID. Um, this these tend to be the the more likely to be the walking pneumonias where um, the the fever is different. Um, it might be more low grade. You're not getting as much sputum production because again, the alveoli are not filling up. Um, and it's just, a, it's a different immune response uh, entirely. Um, so um, your, your symptoms are just a lot different. Um, so in a, you're less likely to have people to, um, uh, uh, who it, it, it tends to strike younger folks, you know, and so um, the cla the uh, pneumococcal infections are much uh, harder on on people with altered immune systems and much more frequent. Um, whereas this can happen in almost anybody, including young people. Um, so your exam, uh, you might hear wheezing, but you're not going to hear any of those uh, signs that I had. Um, mentioned before for typical pneumonia uh, and generally you know this is often treated as an outpatient where people get uh, some antibiotics and get better so um, again this is <laughs> just prior to covid um, and this is still uh, you know so so strep pneumo is still by far the major cause of community acquired pneumonia. Um, and H flu can also uh, give you more of the typical pneumonia uh, appearance as well. Um, your um, atypical uh, organisms like chlamydia, mycoplasma, and Legionella are um, a more minor. Staph aureus, far more dangerous when it, it happens as a pneumonia um, because, again, uh, bacteremia would be, uh, you know, you, you get a lot more complications from bacteremia. And again, when we see a patient come in with staph pneumonia, usually it's very dramatic. And so if it's a mild pneumonia, it's almost never staph. Uh, and then gram negative bacilli do it. And so, yeah, so prior to to COVID, you know, viruses, you know, were a, a, a significant portion, but now, it, you know, the the data would be blown out of the water for uh, presentation in the last couple of years um, because of the, the huge number of COVID cases. Okay, so let's go. So last time, you know, this was kind of, this was fresh off the presses. It was um, when I gave the talk that these uh, new guidelines came out. So I'll run over them again, just in case, you know, people aren't, you know, familiar. You know, a lot of us, you know, have seen a lot of changes over the years, and a lot of us are familiar with the old HCAP um, designation. Um, and so, which you know it really came out around 2007 um there was this real switch to uh treating for uh resistant organisms because so many people were dying of MRSA or pseudomonas because they weren't being covered when they came into the hospital um and so there was a real uh pendulum swing to kind of over treating that uh, was overturned in 2019. So um, and they also made new recommendations on uh, you know what you should do when a, uh, for um, diagnosing when people come in. So a lot of this again you have to watch out for you know whether or not it's severe disease which are generally patients who are going to be hospitalized rather than the outpatient setting. So um, 
So you would um, usually do sputum, you know, if you're treating somebody as an outpatient, you usually wouldn't get a sputum culture, um, but you would get an in severe disease. Um, so uh, the updates in 2019 are, you know, if you have a, somebody with severe disease coming in, it's recommended that you get it so you can get a diagnosis. Um, but also, you know, if you're bringing somebody in and you think that they have MRSA or Pseudomonas, <clears throat> we want to get a hold of that sample. Um, you know, first of all, because it's going to, you know, if we positively diagnose a MRSA pneumonia or a Pseudomonas pneumonia, it's going to change the way we treat the patient, um, but it, both in the length of treatment and the antibiotics. So you should get a sputum culture. If somebody comes in with severe disease or you're worried that it's MRSA or, or Pseudomonas, you know, we say get a culture. Um, again, blood cultures have been pretty standard for a long time for this. It's kind of a national standard that you get them in a certain number of hours. Um, and again, we'd like to get those if, for people who we think are infected with resistant organisms. Um, so one big change that uh, 2007, there was a strong recommendation for macrolide monotherapy. I'm going to go into um, antibiotic treatments in, in just a minute. Um, but and you'll so you'll see why these things change that this is became a a conditional recommendation for outpatients and we'll look at resistance why. Uh, Procalcitonin just wasn't really used as much in 2007. And again, I'm going to talk about it. Um, again, I'm going to emphasize uh, its use, whether or not you would use it for initial antibacterial therapy. Um, they say no, uh, uh, but there's other uses for it. Uh, steroids, again, are always an argument in infection, whether or not they would be helpful or not, especially when we're looking at, you know, as again, I was emphasizing before uh, the different uh, immune responses to these infections. And again, another little pitch for, you know, a little sidelight for COVID. Um, a lot of the the worst cases are folks who have a very serious immune response. Uh, in fact, there's this cytokine storm we see there, and we were all all of us in ID at the beginning of this. I mean, we talk about this you know weekly, and at the beginning of of the COVID epidemic, we said no no corticosteroids. You know, and again, this was what the 2019. You know, this is what we were we were looking at for most pneumonias that, you know, there wasn't a good evidence that corticosteroids were helpful. And then there was this huge study that came out and dexamethasone has probably saved more lives than, <laughs> than all of our antibiotics in the, as far as COVID goes. Um, so uh, the, the things have changed, you know, um, and again, it's, it was just uh, uh, based on evidence from really good trials. So uh, for most pneumonias other than um, COVID, we do not use corticosteroids. For COVID, we absolutely do. Uh, one thing I would say about steroids is that in a COVID patient who requires oxygen, there's a mortality benefit. In a COVID patient who does not require oxygen, there's a an increase in mortality if you use corticosteroids. So again, it's important to uh, reckon, you know, use them wisely. Um, so the other thing that happened 2019, we, again, there's this healthcare associated pneumonia. I mean, basically, we were saying that anybody who, you know, visited somebody in a nursing home the last 90 days should have, you know, expanded antibiotics. And it was just uh, it, it was it was too much, and so um, they abandoned that category and um, want people to kind of just look more at, you know, directly on the the local um, resistance patterns or you know what the what the patient's actual risks are, um, and then uh, standard and pair PA again. This is for severe. Uh, cap, um, they would say that you could use either a macrolide or fluoroquinolone, um, but they're, they accepted, uh, they wanted more macrolides for uh, severe pneumonia. Um, again, this is not outpatient. Um, and then uh, chest imaging, it, it, the, the problem is the, the uh, x-rays stay abnormal for 
an extended period of time. The again, all the what we're seeing on the X-ray is that infiltration of neutrophils or other cells, and we'll clear the infection, and those cells uh, retreat from those areas much more slowly. So repeat X-ray is not helpful unless there's like some great worsening. Um, so samples that you would get uh, when somebody comes in. Again, we talked about getting sputum samples. Um, don't need it for outpatient. You do want it for uh, severe pneumonia so that we can you know, find these uh, uh, other more resistant organisms. Uh, innovative patients, is, it's a really great place. You know, it's a lot of times people are like, oh, you're just gonna get spit, you know. I find there's a lot of resistance to getting uh, cultures and a lot of, especially in the ER, uh, a lot of people get started on uh, antibiotics for different reasons um, without getting a culture. Um, because they're worried, I don't know, that it's a waste of time or you're going to go down the wrong direction. But we're, it's it's very helpful because, you know, if, if we just get local, you know, sputum flora, that's fine. We can ignore that. But when we get a pathogen here, it's incredibly helpful. We, you know, know what antibiotics to use, uh, what they're sensitive to. Um, innovative patients are really helpful because you're going past all that oral stuff. If you get, you know, generally, there's actually a good negative uh, predictive value. If you get an innovative patient, you get a deep culture from them. It's almost it's almost like getting a BAL. You're getting a deep sample, and if it's negative for infection, that's a pretty good indication that they don't have a, a bacterial deep bacterial infection. Um, blood cultures. Um, uh, so, yeah, more more for patients who are inpatient, um, uh, Legionella urinary antigen. Again, Legionella is just a very difficult, it's a, it is a pretty dramatic pneumonia for especially, you know, in the category of these interstitial pneumonias. It's not like uh, mycoplasma or chlamydia at all. Uh, it's very serious. It takes 14 days to 21 days of treatment. Um, and so, um, you know, you would, you would, uh, again, you wouldn't get it for an outpatient um, uh, or for most folks um, if they're very sick, uh, so severe disease, then you're going to start thinking about it or, you know, they were just somewhere that there was an outbreak, something like that, you'd want to use it. The, the urinary antigen only um, detects one of the serotypes, um, but but it can be helpful. And the big change you would, you know, the other thing about Legionella is that um, you would really want to use like a fluoroquinolone. If you found it, you know, the um, doxycycline will not cover that, uh, whereas azithromycin and levofloxacin would. So it is helpful to know if somebody has that. Um, pneumococcal uh, urinary antigen, um, not routinely used. Um, this has really been, <laughs> it's funny, we brought this out in our, our hospital, um, you know, a few years ago, and it, it hasn't had a, quite the impact that we thought. I, a, a hospitalist the other day found it positive, and he's like, oh my God, it was actually positive in somebody, you know. So, um, you know, some people have questioned the cost and usefulness. But it really can be very helpful in, um, you know, limiting antibiotics and, uh, you know, focusing in on just treating pneumococcus rather than, especially if you're uh, treating somebody broadly, it allows us to narrow, which is really helpful. Um, when to look for flu is anytime, you know, flu is in the uh, community, and so you can do this anywhere. And then basically, so, and for COVID, you know, at this point, you know, there's enough that we just look for it and anybody who has pneumonia, it's, it's helpful to look for it. Um, I was gonna put in an extra slide here. Um, the, you know, when, when the COVID epidemic started, we spent so much time like trying to get tests done. You know, and basically you needed, you know, the these um, PCR tests to find it. and there is this huge lag of, of getting it done. We used to you know, send it to UW and it was like two weeks later, you'd find out they had 
uh, COVID, which is really hard for, you know, our studies and treatment and, and, and all that. Now it's rapid. It's part of, it's usually part of the influenza screen in the ERs. So um, you can get it very quickly. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is that I think that because we've, we're using these molecular studies more often, the other thing that's out there is a full uh, respiratory pathogen screen. And I mentioned this um, last time, Th these are becoming more and more available and popular. In fact, you know, in the last year, we at Swedish also have a blood PCR for identifying organisms. So, you know, very quickly before the um, the cultures are out, you can identify somebody who has MRSA bacteremia or not. So in the same way, um, the uh, respiratory pathogen panels uh, have come out. They, you know, they include, uh, you know, flu, they include other viruses. So again, if you're, you're trying to figure out whether you have a viral infection versus a, a pneumococcal infection, also versus an atypical, these are very helpful. And so, yeah, last time I didn't know, do you guys, I'm just curious, do you guys have the um, respiratory pathogen PCR panel? Is that used very often, at least in the hospital there? We, we have the, um, yeah, we have the respiratory panel, but we don't have the pneumonia panel. So we, we can look at, we can figure out which virus it is, but we, but we can't figure out which uh, bacteria it is. Right. We do have the we do have the blood culture uh, PCR. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So the one so one really interesting helpful thing on the respiratory panel, you know, it has a whole bunch of different viruses, but it also detects uh, mycoplasma and chlamydia. So you actually have on there a diagnosis for your atypical pneumonias. So if somebody comes in and they get started on like ceftriaxone and azithromycin, if those, um, if your respiratory panel is negative for mycoplasma and uh, chlamydia, and you don't think it's Legionella either, you can actually stop your azithromycin. So that's something that's kind of uh, helpful to look at on those panels if you have them available. Um, again, we don't get them as an outpatient very often because they don't come back fast enough. Um, so, uh, so outpatient treatment. So by I, uh, ATS and IDSA guidelines currently, um, actually they still prefer amoxicillin um, because it's going to treat the vast majority. Um, and uh, second line is doxycycline, which is going to, you know, kill your uh, atypicals, but also, you know, to be honest, you'll see pneumococcus is quite sensitive to doxycycline. Um, and then the macrolides that we used to use all the time, like everybody gets a Z pack. Um, they say you can use it, but only if your local resistance is under 25%. And so you can see a couple different, um, mostly people would use azithromycin because it's better tolerated, uh, you know, with a Z pack. Um, but here, so this is what's quite helpful. So there's a, um, this active bacterial core surveillance group. It's this consortium across the United States. In our area, it includes um, Portland and San Francisco and Denver, and um, you know a bunch of major um, centers across the states. So this is a, a kind of a amalgam of all those uh, places. So more of a national average, but it's, it, it often reflects what we have in our area as well. And so you can see for streptococcus, um, you know, the um, the uh, erythromycin rate, uh, azithromycin and erythromycin. So they use erythromycin in the lab. It's just as a surrogate for azithromycin. They match up. And you can see, can you see my, um, my arrow while I'm highlighting stuff? Yes. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. So, so anyway, so um, so again, this 29.3%, you know, that's quite high. So most places in the United States, your your macrolide resistance is over 25%. So it really actually is not a, your first line um, or even second line for outpatient 
uh, pneumonia, um, you'll see that um, doxycycline is pretty good still, you know. So this is where uh, doxycycline comes in. Um, other things that are interesting about this, uh, uh, the penicillin resistance is around 1.7% now. Uh, again, this, and that's actually gone down over the years. Um, there, there seems to be an association uh, between that going down and immunization uh, against streptococcus. Um, and when you're talking about, you know, severe disease as well, you know, a lot there, there's always been this fear that if you had meningitis, um, that, you know, just using, you know, you wouldn't want to use necessarily penicillin um, because, you know, the, the severity, you, you might miss 1.7%. Um, and so a lot of times for, you know, for meningitis, you know, it's recommended you go ahead and use vancomycin as well because there is no resistance there. Um, if you have true meningitis, I would agree to, you know, that you would want vancomycin, but so cefotaxime basically is, is, is the same sensitivity, is same susceptibility as the ceftriaxone. I, I, actually, ceftriaxone might be, a, there might be a little bit more sensitivity to ceftriaxone among streptococcus, but this is 0.3%. And so if you have somebody with, you know, pneumonia, or if they get bacteremic, you know, there's an argument as whether or not you would want, you would need to, you um, treat them with vancomycin in addition to ceftriaxone. If, you know, if there's any sense that they might be, have meningitis or early meningitis, you'd want to add the ceftriaxone, but uh, streptococcus is very well covered by ceftriaxone, which of course gets into the CNS quite well. Um, so that's what a lot of these um, recommendations are kind of based on and where we're at right now, uh, uh, mostly regionally, but uh, certainly nationally. Uh, so you know, for alternatives um, to outpatient um, treatment, um, there are combination therapies that will cover, um, you know, for, for, you know, more resistant um, uh, th uh, organisms. Um, the pro so cefpidoxime and cefuroxime, you could use, uh, again, you saw that the, um, the sensitivities to the third generation cephalosporin is quite high um, in among pneumococcus. The only disadvantage to the oral cephalosporins I'll mention is that they're poorly oral, uh, poorly bioavailable, um, usually more around 30%, where you know um, most of our other better antibiotics might be 80, 90, and in the case of levofloxacin, 99%. Um, so these are alternates that you could use. Um, in, in an outpatient setting um, as well. But we, again, they're not considered the first line for, um, again, both for toxicity, you're gonna get a lot more um, side effects from augmentin and, and uh, fluoroquinolones than, than you are from um, the other antibiotics. So the other thing when you're deciding on treatment is, you know, how severe um, the uh, the um, infection is, you know, um, so where, again, those tr those treatment guidelines uh, for um, for ADSA is that, you know, you could use a, you know, they're not recommending a fluoroquinolone. Again, the macrolides will treat the the atypicals, but not necessarily as we've shown the um, the pneumococcus. So um, there's no um, recommendations for you know very very rarely would you use a macro, you wouldn't really use a macrolide alone these days. Um, you could use a fluoroquinolone alone. Um, in the severe case, um, you'd you'd probably use both. Okay, so. Uh, so again, what the the two organisms we really worry about for resistance and what has really changed a lot of our practice over time are, are MRSA and, and Pseudomonas. They're um, you know the the two. They're not only are they worse uh, as far as the diseases that they cause, 
but this is where you know you can miss uh, coverage with antibiotics because they're more resistant, obviously. So for MRSA, um, vancomycin is still um, the preferred uh, regimen. Linazolid is also um, effective. Uh, and linazolid's price has come down dramatically. Uh, it used to be, you know, hundreds of dollars or, or even more, uh, but now it's generic, uh, so it's it's easier to take. Um, I think the the uh, some of the uh, uh, reluctance to use it would be, you know, patients on SSRIs, which are common. Although there's a huge argument whether or not how significant that is among. Uh, ID doctors in our practice, so some of us will use them much more readily. Um, Pseudomonas, uh, these are your the major options. Um, and so the the real problem with Pseudomonas, as soon as we get a Pseudomonas infection, is that all of these treatments are you know eight hours, uh, Q8 hours or more. You can't use ertapenem, which is our uh, once a day. Uh, carbapenem, it does not cover Pseudomonas. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, again, these are all going to be um, generally inpatient uh, treatments and um, that, that will cover them. Okay, so, and you would want, you know, if you have risk factors, you're going to want to um, look for these. Now, there is always, you know, the, there's a historical thing about Pseudomonas double coverage. The whole reason for double coverage was never to enhance your um, treatment of the disease. It was just to be more likely to catch a, the, uh, the, uh, an antibiotic that works. So um, you're more likely to find, you know, to if you use two of these, you're more likely to have uh, sensitivity to one of them. And so later, you know, um, if anybody ever uses uh, double coverage, that would be in an area where there's so much resistance that you're afraid that just using one, uh, that you, you'd be using an effective drug. Um, again, we really like to get cultures uh, when you're worried about Pseudomonas so that we can identify the sensitivities. Once you have sensitivity on the Pseudomonas, if you are using double coverage, you should narrow it to whatever uh, single agent that it's sensitive to. Michael, um, this is Mark, uh, Mark Fisher. Uh, I, I've had a recent patient with a very stubborn, uh, severe um, uh, sort of a Pseudomonas uh, purulent bronchitis syndrome, you know, um, not pure pneumonia. Yeah. But, uh, but very, very debilitating. And these, uh, these, as you mentioned, the three time a day dosing is pretty daunting for, uh, for outpatient treatment in those that for a variety of reasons can't take a quinolone. And I've had some luck recently with one patient uh, with some really nice guidance from our pharmacy as to using Zosin for example, with CAD pump dosing, yep. uh, where they come in and get their CAD pump changed once a day in the short stay unit. And it really uh, worked very nicely for that patient for a couple weeks of pretty intense antibiotics. Yeah, that is true. I'll, um, yeah, I will often offer folks um, with Zosin or with Unison as well, um, uh, you know, to be able to just put it on a pump and go, you know, uh, 24 hours and then just interact with the pump. You know, some people don't like being attached the whole time, but that is that is a really great, um, a great uh, intervention. Another little pearl I'll throw out there for patients like yours, you know, it tends to happen in patients who have bronchiectasis, um, where, you know, the, those, those airways have been so scarred um, that they accumulate, uh, you know, um, you know, goop in there all the time. And so they're almost more like uh, a cystic fibrosis patient. And they'll have, especially Pseudomonas, loves the, to uh, colonize uh, these, uh, you know, these mucus layers in, in those upper airways. And those patients will come back and have exacerbations uh, again and again. Um, and so that can be a really hard. And so, first of all, we end up usually treating them for 14 days because, you know, again, it's trying to, to get in that upper 
airway, you're not getting as much, you know, the alveoli are, are easier to get antibiotics into because they're so exposed to the blood. Um, so first, you know, I would say, you know, you need a longer period of time. But one real trick, uh, you know, that brings back azithromycin. Azithromycin, you, as you see, does not treat pseudomonas at all. Um, but it has an anti-inflammatory effect in patients with bronchiectasis where they can take it. Um, I mean, this seems like an overuse of antibiotics, uh, but you can take uh, azithromycin daily, like 250, and it will decrease the inflammation and the sputum production and exacerbations of pseudomonas where a, where a patient who comes in you know, every few months with an exacerbation and has a two week, you know, course of, you know, one of these IV antibiotics to get rid of it. Um, suddenly they won't, they won't get them anymore. The other, um, the other uh, thing sometimes people do is monthly inhaled tobramycin to keep those exacerbations down. But yeah, it's really hard to treat those, especially with all this. And, um, and yeah, but although the, the, this would be a good home, home possibility for some people. Um, and uh, steroids, I kind of went over that again. Um, you know, uh, we definitely avoided them, but there is a very significant role in, in uh, SARS-CoV-2, which has been a real change for us. Um, length of treatment generally when, if it's, uh, you're again, because the alveoli are easy to get antibiotics into, we tend to be able to, uh, treat them, um, pretty quickly in five days. Uh, MRSA and Pseudomonas, this says seven days, but I will tell you that generally we go longer, like 10 to 14 days. Um, the disease is much worse and often it, it can be in those upper airways, um, which are harder to get to. Um, well, serial procalcitonin is where, this is where procalcitonin really shines as a useful um, uh, lab. And I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, about when you can stop antibiotics. Um, so if you have other infections, again, if, you know, if your pseudomonas or your, I'm sorry, your pneumococcus is caused endocarditis or, or meningitis, then, um, you're, you'll, you'll want it to use it for a lot longer. Um, okay. And then of course, you know, TB and fungi is a whole different story. Um, so this is just a little example of what, um, the, uh, I, I pulled from the, Providence ED, what they often use. Um, they're actually using a sometimes a pretty uh, like higher dose for three days of azithromycin or doxy. And then, you know, if you're having these comorbidities, you know, this is where you can, as an outpatient, use those expanded antibiotic regimens. Um, or, you know, beta lactime allergy, you can use levofloxacin. If you're a severe pneumonia, um, generally is uh, ceftriaxone and zithros what's chosen or levo if you're allergic to beta lactams um, and we'll talk about aspiration using uh, uh, flagell or, or, or um, metronidazole uh, and then they say you know you really should you know be careful about um, doing the if uh, you know if you really think that there is an actual uh, aspiration versus somebody who's you know, you're not sure of. Okay. All right. Uh, so a little bit on. So um, again, they got rid of HCAP. Uh, so nosocomial pneumonias are either hospital acquired pneumonias or uh, ventilator acquired pneumonias. Um, and so the again, the guidelines kind of, you know, for these as well. Um, you know, again, you're you're more you're much more likely at this point to have a resistant organism like Pseudomonas and MRSA. Um, you, you've been, you know, in the hospital. So hospital acquired is, you know, this is like you've been there for 48 eight hours or on the vent, you've been on the vent. Um, I'm just starting to forget how many hours you need to be on it. But again, you're at this point, you'll, you'll have been exposed to uh, organisms in the hospital environment. And so your, your risk of pseudomonas and MRSA goes up. Uh, again, we used to throw this on for people who had, you know, just been in healthcare at all, but now, now it's just these things. Um, so, and, and most, a lot of times, um, so you can cover MRSA, um, 
the it, it is pretty helpful to run a, a MRSA nasal PCR. Uh, you know, it, gen, that that's fairly that's highly predictive, at least in pneumonia. Uh, sometimes we'll do nasal um, colonization tests, uh, and maybe it might not be quite as um, predictive about whether or not you have MRSA in a wound, but um, for pneumonia, because you know it's connecting your your um, testing part of the airway with the nasal colonization, um, it's pretty helpful. To, to know, uh, but usually up front, you know, a lot of people will go ahead and, and cover if there's a uh, a lot of MRSA. Um, and then um, procalcitonin is, is becoming more helpful at this point because this this will be a patient who's been in the uh, in the uh, hospital, you know, for more than a day generally. Um, and so if you know if you're using your so let's talk about procalcitonin and how it helps this is where as an outpatient procalcitonin is not so helpful because first of all you'd have to get, wait for the test to come back and also early on for starting antibiotics it's not as useful but once you have somebody's been exposed um you're much more likely to um to be able to uh use the procalcitonin so and it's also helpful um, uh, when you're talking about, especially procalcitonin is a very helpful guide between aspiration pneumonitis and aspiration pneumonia. So um, let me talk about this at this point. So uh, a pneumonitis. Michael, again, we have a time check. Uh, we have a time check of about five minutes, Michael. Okay. Yeah, I can just run through these. So again, pneumonitis. If you have an aspiration, you're going to get a. Uh, response to that um, versus whether or not you actually get a bacterial infection set up. So they're they're you know they look a little bit different. Uh, you know that's this this happens very quickly. This happens over time, and so um, you'd want to do you'd want to cover in an aspiration event. Uh, you want to use flagell. I mean that's what we're really talking about. Whether or not you would use flagell. So again, abscess or empyema are generally from these uh, from aspirations, and you're getting anaerobes from the gut getting in there. Um, and so procalcitonin, you know, that it's been around. Um, it it's it, it's a biomarker of bacterial infection, a recognition in the alveoli of uh, bacterial components, um, which you know again creates a certain uh, immune response versus viral infection. It goes up pretty quickly within hours, but um, but you can see where it, you know, it might, you know, it, it, it might take a day or two before it actually comes up. Um, I had some other things to talk about COVID, <laughs> skip, um, about how you kind of prevent some of the viral, um, you know, treating viruses when they come in here, have a different, um, a different response. Uh, so again, there's been meta analyses which show that it is helpful in stopping antibiotics and limiting antibiotic use. You have to be careful with procalcitonin because it goes up in renal failure. Um, there's a, there's a whole list of other things that can kind of cause this as well. I have my favorite little list, but you need to recognize that there are a few other things that can cause its elevation. Um, also, it's um, sepsis is a major cause of elevation of procalcitonin. Uh, and so as far as initiation of antibiotics, you know, uh, it's not recommended by the IDSA to use your procalcitonin as far as whether or not to give antibiotics to try to decide if it's a bacterial or um, viral pneumonia, but you can use it to stop antibiotics later um, or, or stop sepsis um, treatment. Uh, so at Swedish, because of this, uh, basically what we do is do serial measurements of antibiotics uh, while people are on antibiotics. Um, if, if your procalcitonin remains negative, uh, then your the, the likelihood you have a bacterial pneumonia, particularly like a pneumococcal pneumonia, goes down, and you can often stop the antibiotics. Also, if you uh, have a decrease in procalcitonin by 80% um, from peak, then you can stop antibiotics at that point. 
at any time we can stop antibiotics is hugely important to antimicrobial stewardship. So we do use procalcitonin on the AMS. That's it. Oh, what a great summary, uh, both for ambulatory and inpatients. Uh, are, are, uh, do anybody in the room here have questions? Uh, um, or, or maybe online if you want to unmute and ask a question. Uh, Dr. Kennedy, Scott Kennedy has a question. This was sort of off the off the side, but you know, we as we as we enter this respiratory season, we're talking a lot about um, viruses that the kids haven't been passing around for a couple of years. Yeah. Do we do we have a similar phenomena to anticipate with um, chlamydia and um, um, uh, my, mycoplasma? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, again, it's because the kids have not, and again, this really has to do with kids. You know, a lot of our respiratory viral seasons are based around school. So, um, and so influenza season, you know, starts when the kids go back to school and picks up from there. Um, and the, again, RSV has been a big one uh, right now in the in in kids, um, but we don't really see that with the you know the mycoplasma the atypical uh, mycoplasma and, and chlamydia infections don't tend to um, to correlate as much. It tends to be like a young adult um, type of thing. So I don't imagine that we will. Um, I think that there's this huge reservoir of kids that stayed inside and didn't get these respiratory viruses. Um, so for respiratory viruses, very much so, but for the uh, atypical uh, or, uh, bacteria, I would say not. Well, again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bolton and Sarah. Thanks from <clears throat> for Swedish for uh, 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 sort of continuing this support. And uh, uh, we'll look forward to getting together in a month. And, uh, and uh, have a good weekend, folks. Thanks so much. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks Thank you.